welcome to the Brexit Central podcast. I'm joined today by Lance Foreman, who's number two in the candidates list for the Brexit party in the London region. Hi, Lance. Good morning. Uh, where are we at the moment? Uh, physically? Physically, we where are, are we? We're sitting in my office. Um, we're in Hackneywick in East London, or Fish Island, as it's uh, colloquially known. Um, and um, our business is a salmon smokehouse. And uh, we've been based in the East End of London since 1905. It was started by my great granddad. But in this particular premises uh, for about the last 10 years, uh, we used to be um, on a site which is now the running track of the Olympic Stadium. So what on earth are you doing um, running for office? That's a very good question. I sort should, of, should uh, you be running your own office? <laughs> <laughs> I should be running my own office. Look, I think there are a lot of people that are very, very frustrated with what's been going going on in the in the last few years. People that haven't been in the political world, um, you know, people that are just coming together, you know, from business, academia, you know, all sorts of walks of life that are just angry um, that you know, thinking they were living in a democracy where your vote counted for something, and just angry that there's been so much resistance and they're basically standing up and saying look if the political class class can't get their act together we want to step in and do something and yeah it's a risky thing to do you know we're putting our heads above the parapet and uh yesterday that had a personal impact on my life because um we you know we we found out i, I literally just got off a plane and my phone rang and my office told me that um there's there's a 30 foot swastika appeared on uh, my building, um, which uh, is obviously completely outrageous, but personally uh, particularly hurtful, given that my family fled persecution from the Nazis um, on both sides of my family. My, my dad, who's is actually a Holocaust survivor, and my great-granddad, who founded this business back in uh, 1905, was fleeing the anti-Semitic pogroms of... Uh, you know, Russia and Ukraine. That's why he arrived, you know, in, you know, what he thought was the safety of London. And of course, it has been a, you know, a great place to live for the last hundred years. But uh, anti-Semitism is rearing its ugly head again. Because you're Jewish, aren't you? I am Jewish. Um, and um, what's amazing, actually, in the, in the, uh, amongst the Brexit candidates in London, is you have such an extraordinarily diverse group of people. You know, people, um, the Remain side have talked about uh, you know, the xenophobia of the Brexiteers. But actually, if you look at the London candidates for the Brexit party, uh, you have three Jewish candidates. One um, candidate whose family were from Pakistan and who's half Muslim, half Christian. Another uh, black Christian. Um, you, you know, you've got black, brown and white. You've got um, a Hindu, an atheist, another Christian one who's half Baha'i, half uh, Jewish, you know, you have an incredible diverse mix. And the one thing we all have in common is that we are passionate about democracy. And that's what this is about now. It's, you know, the argument has moved on. This is not just about Brexit and whether you believe in Europe. This is about whether you believe that a democratic vote should be upheld. And, you know, when people insult us with, you know, people didn't know what they were voting for and the facts have changed... You never hear Leavers saying that. It's only the Remain side that say that because, of course, they want to have another vote. But it's just an insult to our intelligence, quite frankly. So how did you actually get involved then? Did you um, get a call from Mr Farage to say, can you stand? Or, or was it? did you put yourself forward? A um, little bit of both, actually. Um, I was quite actively involved in the Brexit campaign. Um, more on the, actually on the Vote Leave side rather than the Leave EU uh, side of things. Um, and... I got involved because um, before my life in the fish business, I actually was a political advisor. I was working for Peter Lilly, who was, uh, well, according to John Major, he was a bastard. <laughs> so he was actually a very charming and intelligent individual. So I think John Major got that one wrong. Um, but, you know, even then, I remember, you know, that was 30 years ago. We were pro-EU, um, pro the widening of the EU, not the deepening of the EU. You know, we are, you know, we believe in this global world and we were certainly very pro-free trade and even single market because it was all about free trade in those days. What's happened over the last 30 years is that it's gone deeper and deeper. There have been, you know, a raft of regulations. Just I think just since the referendum itself, there's been about 1,500 new regulations. 
you know, and, and that's not what it was about 30 years ago. I've always had, uh, you know, well, I've, I've particularly had an issue with, with the EU. And I think for me, it all went horribly wrong when you had the introduction of the single currency. Um, and the reason I say that is because, you know, I've always believed that economics trumps politics. And, you know, if you look at, you know, the collapse of communism in the Soviet Union, it wasn't because of the communist philosophy, it was because people were starving and there were bread queues. And that's where it went probably wrong. And it's always the economics that, uh, that drives change. And for me, um, the single currency was a huge mistake for Europe because you don't, you know, once you fix that currency and you don't have the, the flexibility of this pivot that allows economies to rebalance as their economic cycles change, what you actually do is you create a dependency culture where the weaker economies become dependent on the richer ones. Um, and that, of course, builds resentment because people are having to make payments to economies they don't think are as efficient as they are. And, you know, and, and you get resentment from the other side because the donors start wanting to lay down ever stronger uh, restrictions on how those economies should be run. And indeed, you know, you had Greece and Italy with, you know, politicians forced upon them. Um, and so you get resentment building and resentment uh, leads to extremism. And, you know, if you look at Europe now, you have more extremism on both right and left than you've had at any time since the Second World War. And I saw this, you know, this is not something that is shocking me in any sense or form, because I believe that this would happen since the single currency first came, you know, uh, came into being. I've, I, you know, I've seen this scenario play out. And in my view, it will end up in, with chaos in Europe. Mm. And when I put this to colleagues, they, they always say to me, oh, yeah, but, but Britain's not in the single currency, so why is it a problem? And it's a problem because if there's chaos in Europe, we will get dragged in you know, by the sort of gravitational pull of this thing, and we'll end up having to sort out Europe once again, as we've done, uh, done in the past. And so for me, Brexit was about trying to, you know, in some way, torpedo the project. Because the EU leadership, you know, they want a federal Europe, um, they want an empire, and that's why the single currency was introduced. And if they're not going to change that, then you have to torpedo the project. And if, for me, if it wasn't for the single currency, I could almost, you know, be a Remainer. Mm. I, you know, I, I, I see the real problems coming from the, uh, the, the currency and the, the economics of uh, Europe. So for you, it's, it's about saving Europe. You're not really on the same page as the likes of Jacob Rees-Mogg, who says, look, when we leave, we need to um, support the EU. It, it's going to be our best friend. We, we hope it continues. You actually want to destroy it for the sake of the people. Well, I don't want to destroy it, but I, I just think that Europe will be a much safer place if you have liberal democracies, you know, thriving and uh, trading with one another in a peaceful way. Empires always collapse in chaos. And, you know, whether it's Yugoslavia or Russia or go back to the Austro-Hungarian Empire or, you know, the, the Romans, the Greeks, the Babylonians, they always end in chaos. And I just think that this idea that you have to have this you know, greater Europe to stand up to America and China is completely misguided. And I think we will be much stronger. Europe will be much stronger as, you know, nations that compete with one another. And, you know, they, you, know you, you grow through competition and trade. And, um, I, you know, that's the sort of Europe that I want. How do you see Britain's place in the world right now? Um, well, I think that, um, I think it's a very exciting time for Britain. Um, you know, I think that... Uh, not only do I think we will see uh, Brexit delivered, um, you know, I am an optimist, but I do think it will be delivered. But actually, I think that because we've had to fight so hard for it now, we will end up with a far better Brexit than might have happened if this would have just slid through back in 2016. I think that um, the Brexit party has given people a lot of hope. Um, and, and the fact that you have, you know, a different class of person entering into politics now, people with real experience. I mean, this is one of the problems with politics now. You know, you have these, you know, this sort of political class that know nothing else. You know, they come out of college, they've got into political lobbying and then work their way through the system, become, you know, candidates, lose it the first time on a bad seat. And then, you know, they, they work their way through. They have no real experience outside of that. So there are downsides to people like you who have their own businesses. They've got their own um, set up actually entering the political class 
aren't there? I mean, how on earth are you going to do it? How are you going to cope being an MEP and also running this business? Um, well, I don't look. I don't think the uh, well. First of all, I don't think the role of an MEP is that onerous. Quite frankly, um, secondly, I have a very good uh, team of people here. You know, for about. Uh, Five years of my life, I was fighting for the survival of this business when we were being forcibly evicted uh, by the Olympics. Um, you know, and I managed to sort of uh, fight that battle and not just fight on our behalf. I was speaking, you know, as the spokesman for all 350 businesses in the area that were being evicted. But the reason that um, we're getting involved in the European elections is not because we want to be uh, MEPs, it's because we don't want to be MEPs. Um, and um, we, you know, we sort of feel that in some respects, um, we want to give people hope that democracy will be delivered. But also, we want to show the Europeans that, you know, if we can't, if we can't beat them from the outside, we're going to try and beat them from the inside. We haven't worked out the strategy yet. But once the election's over, hopefully there'll be a, a large number of Brexit Party MEPs and we will sit down together and work out our best strategy from, you know, de delivering Brexit from the inside. And I think the EU fears that. You know, I think they have very serious concerns about that and they, they should do. But surely only the Conservative Party can deliver Brexit with a new leader? Um, not at all. I mean, I think the Conservative Party has shown that they actually can't deliver Brexit. Uh, the Conservative Party is completely split. Um, they have completely the wrong leader for the job. Yeah, I, I was I was interviewed on uh, a TV channel um, about it was it was I think a day or two after Theresa May put her hat into the ring for leadership, and Boris and Michael Gove hadn't quite worked it out at that stage. Mm. And um, I think the final question of the interview was. Um, who do I think should be leader of the Conservative Party? And I didn't really want to commit to who I thought should be leader, but what I said was that um, I don't think it should be Theresa May. And they said, well, why not? And I said, well, there are two reasons. First of all, she was silent throughout the entire campaign. And if you want to be a leader, you can't be silent. You have to tell people what you think and hopefully carry them with you or, or not, as the case may be. But leadership is about... You know, um, it's not about focus groups. It's about knowing your own mind and, you know, persuading people that that, that is the way forward. But um, the other reason, I said, is that you cannot have somebody that doesn't believe in this. And that has proven to be absolutely right. And I gave an example. I said, look, if, if in my own business I had a project that needed to be delivered, I would never take on somebody that doesn't believe in that project. Because first of all, they're less likely to do a good job. And then when it does go horribly pear-shaped, they would come back to me and say, well, I did tell you, Mr. Foreman, it was never going to work. You have to have belief. It's very hard to sell something convincingly if you don't believe in it. And Theresa May has been interviewed many, many times. And they, you know, she's been asked, you know, do you believe in this? And she's never been able to say, yes, I do. She, she always has to say, well, this is what people want. and I'm the best person to deliver it. That's not good enough. Do you think the so-called Spartans of the ERG, the uh, the Tory MPs who are still voting against Theresa May's deal, do you think they truly believe in Brexit? The ones that are voting um, against her deal absolutely believe in Brexit. There's no question they believe in Brexit because uh, her deal is not Brexit. So why are the Brexit Party reportedly standing against them in the next general election? Um, well, look, it's 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 early days at this stage, but I think. You know, I think the argument has moved on now and it's not just about Brexit anymore. It's about, you know, democracy and, and a new class of politician. You know, I think that there's a, you know, what they're trying to say is that they want to bring in people that have real life experience, that haven't just gone through the mill of, you know, being in Parliament and, and are tainted by having been in Parliament. Because uh, most, most of the public think the you know, politicians are completely hopeless. And so why would you want a former politician in your party? Um, you actually want people that have a much broader experience of life that can actually bring something to bear. But you'd be happy if they defected to the Brexit party? Um, look, it's, um, you know, maybe some of them. I mean, we'd have to look at, I guess, look at individual cases and, you know, see whether we think that they would add something to the party. Um, you know, all sorts of experience is, is useful. Um, so... Perhaps having some political experience is, is useful. Well, that's really not that's not what this is about at this stage. And at this stage, we just want to get through um, the, the European elections 
and then you know we'll sort of uh, gather together afterwards, see how it's gone, and work out the strategy going forward. Why do you think we shouldn't have taken Theresa May's Brexit deal? I mean, she says it delivers Brexit. We kind of gain an end to free movement. Why shouldn't we take it? Well, you know what? There was a period of about two days, two or three days, when I thought perhaps we should take it. It was after Jeffrey Cox had spoken, and I thought, well, maybe there is an escape clause because there are sort of legal obligations on the EU, and you know, if, if the negotiations don't work out, we could just walk away. But I, I actually reflected back to a time when our business was under threat, I mentioned the Olympics, you know, we, we were really fighting for our own survival, uh, absolutely fighting for survival. We couldn't find any to, anywhere to relocate to. And if we didn't relocate within a year, they would have literally torn down our business because they had to get on and build the Olympic Stadium. Now, the government at the time, Ken Livingston, um, at the time, London government, uh, was offering this, this absolutely dreadful site in Leighton, on the wrong side of the Olympic Park. And a lot of my friends and family were saying to me, look, just take this place they're offering you. At least your business will be able to carry on and, you know, don't worry about it. Just, you know, it's not ideal, but just take it. And it was, you know, it was very tempting. You know, I knew it would have saved my business at that moment, but I just thought long and hard. I thought, you know, if I take this site, yes, we will survive now, but it's going to make the life of our business an absolute misery from that day forth. And why would I do that? You know, you've got to think long term. And I think it's a very similar situation here. If we sign a dreadful withdrawal agreement, it might get us out of a hole today, but it's going to make Britain, it's going to put us in a far, far worse position going forward. And so it's really on, on the back of that sort of wider experience, I thought, no, we should not be taking that withdrawal, withdrawal deal. A withdrawal deal, we have to fight for what we believe in and fight for the proper Brexit that people voted for. Okay, just finally, if you did become an MP eventually, I know you're not at that stage yet, would you give up your business? Um, if I became an MP, um, I haven't even made that decision yet. You know, my, uh, um, you know, we're a family business. Would my kids want to come in and run the business? Perhaps they would, perhaps they wouldn't. Um, uh, my eldest is 27 at the moment, um, and uh, he recently became vegan, which is not great if you want to run a smoked salmon business. <laughs> um, but um, so I don't know. You know, I, I joined our family business when I was 32. Um, so I, it's, it really depends on whether you know I want to pass the reins on to the next generation at that stage, or whether you know the team are able to run it without any of my involvement. But uh, that's, a, that's a decision going forward. Let's, uh, let's take one step at a time. Great. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm David Scullion, and I was speaking to Lance Foreman on the Brexit Central podcast. For more interviews on Brexit, please subscribe on iTunes or SoundCloud. And you can sign up to our daily Brexit briefing at brexitcentral.com forward slash subscribe.